My dear brothers and sisters, this evening we hear some bold words from Jesus, which should really shock us all. This is what he says. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father. Those are some pretty bold words. We see in not only the Old Testament, but also the New Testament, a principle of increase amongst God's people. You had Elijah, a prophet, and he worked many mighty deeds. And his successor, Elisha, did twice as many wondrous deeds as he did. When John the Baptist came on the scene, and Jesus was speaking of John the Baptist, he declared that John the Baptist was greater than anyone else who come before him, meaning he was even greater than Elijah and greater than Elisha. And then Jesus surprises us because he says, And yet I tell you, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. But here's the the kicker where we should all be a little shocked to hear Jesus say, The one who believes in me, the works that I have done, he or she will do and greater. Those are the words of Jesus. Those are Jesus' words. We have a decision to make with those words. We can either reject those words as not being relevant to us. We can reject those words as an exaggeration. Or we can try to accept those words and maybe spiritualize them and rob them of their value instead of just saying... What do you mean, Lord? What do you mean? St. Thomas Aquinas, when commenting on these words, said this. He says, What Jesus means by these words is that not just that the number of good deeds that get done throughout the world by the believers of Jesus would be greater than what Jesus had done, He said that also the kind of things that would happen would also be greater. Let me explain what I mean by that. Before, when Jesus was simply walking the earth, Jesus would heal people by touching them, spitting sometimes on his hand and touching them, having them maybe put mud in their eyes and washing in a pool, that kind of a thing. One time he healed somebody by declaring the man healed and the guy was in another town. Peter, one of his disciples, the same Peter who we knew to have denied Jesus, but after his repentance, coming back to the Lord, having said he was sorry to Jesus for not being steadfast, he receives the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and he and John are able, by the power of the Spirit, to heal a cripple at the beautiful gate, just simply by saying, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Then Peter experiences even more and more of the Holy Spirit coming into his life. And he's walking by, and his shadow is passing by sick people, and they're getting healed. Just by his shadow. There's a reason, brothers and sisters, why this can be hard for us to believe. Because something has happened, and we don't know what, that we see this happen where people will find 
This kind of faith in Jesus, this kind of faith in what Jesus said that we would be able to do, not on our own strength, but because of the Holy Spirit, they would find that and they would be able to bring that newness of life in different times. But it seems like every once in a while, the enemy would come in and rob the people of God of their faith. And would throw up all of these kinds of obstacles. We can see this happening in history. Most recently, of course, a hundred years ago, when Mary told us that we were to pray for conversion and repentance. She came to visit three simple humble shepherd children in Fatima, Portugal. To look at them, there was nothing special about them other than the fact that they were disciples. She asked for prayers to be said. She asked for Russia to be consecrated to her Immaculate Heart. And it didn't make sense to anyone at the time because Russia was Orthodox. And yet, a month after the last apparition in October of 1917, one month later, in November of 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution took over Russia and communism began to spread its errors throughout the world in a very profound and malicious way. A system that denies that there is a God. Denies God. And wants to tell people that to believe in God is an opiate. To have faith in God is to put one's trust in some future happiness instead of in the present world. And yet Mary said that in the end, her Immaculate Heart would triumph. Mary's Immaculate Heart is united to the heart of Jesus. Mary is filled with the Holy Spirit She was the one who taught the apostles right before Pentecost how to be open to the Holy Spirit. How to let the Holy Spirit inspire their prayer, inspire their songs, inspire their actions. Because she was the one who at the message of the angel Gabriel said, May it be done unto me according to your word. O God. We want to have that same boldness, brothers and sisters, that when Jesus says, the one who believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these, we want to say with Mary, may it be done unto me according to your word, O God. Because Jesus told us, these things, these signs, wouldn't be signs to glorify ourselves. They wouldn't be signs to say, hey, look at us, aren't we so great? Because that would be the sin of pride, right? Yes. And we would be glorifying ourselves, which is really what the devil would want us to do, right? Right. But instead, these would be signs to glorify God. To say, Jesus is still alive. He's risen from the dead. He's not a fairy tale. He's not make-believe. Why? Because we can see beyond our own human reason. His tangible proof. His tangible evidence. Now, brothers and sisters, like I said, we would want to ask if there was increase from Jesus to Peter, okay, and even more so after Peter, 
right? You had Philip the deacon. He was mentioned in that first reading. Philip the deacon was ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit pops him off to a completely other, completely different city. Boom. And he goes from one place to another by the Holy Spirit. Boom, like that. Just because we can't understand it doesn't mean it's not true. If we tried to understand how God makes Jesus present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist, we won't ever be able to do that. But it doesn't mean it's not true. It means that there is a greater mystery than our human minds can understand. And our faith, then, is not based on what we can understand, but on the one who reveals himself to us, Jesus. That's what Jesus is talking about in those scriptures. That's what we're hearing in that second reading about having our faith built on the cornerstone that is Jesus and not on ourselves. Because that is what has gotten in the way of the church today. Not necessarily the ideology of communism amongst us, because here we are worshiping. But maybe just that unbelief that has kind of worn away at our faith in something beyond our own understanding. Something beyond our own experience. Something that requires us to actually believe in someone other than ourselves. It's a tough word. It's a tough challenge. Last Saturday we had our Peter conference. And I asked permission from... A woman by, who I will call Jean. That's not her name. I asked her permission to share this story. I said, don't worry, I won't say your name. This is what she said to me. She said, Father Chris, when you would preach about doing things like healing and prophesying, I was like, Father Chris, I'm not there. There's no way. Like, she said, I would get frustrated that you would talk about that, Father Chris. Because I just felt like I wasn't there. So she went to this conference. And she heard the talks. And she heard our speakers speaking about how we can hear God's voice. The different ways in which it can be done. And how they had people try it out. Even though it was beyond their own experience. Beyond what they knew. She said she was listening to the talk over again one day, walking, and she just received, she had been praying and asking God for direction in her own life, and she received a text from her cousin. And her cousin said, you know, I just want to let you know that you're a real role model for me and for the girls. She felt like that was an encouragement, the answer to her prayer. And then... She said later that evening, though she had gone back and forth with her cousin a little bit, she'd left off the conversation. She felt the nudge from God to text her cousin and to let her cousin know that God loved her very much and was very proud of her. So she had to screw up the courage a little bit, Jean did. She she texted her cousin and said, this is going to sound crazy, but at the conference I was at, we were told that we could hear from God And that it was okay if we got it wrong. Because at least we were trying. So I'm just going to say what I felt God was saying to me. And she told her, you know, God loves you very much. And he's very proud of you. And that you should be encouraged. Her cousin texted her back and said, This is not crazy at all, Jean. My friend, who will name Brian, was visiting me. And... I was a bit downcast because my parents don't let me go to church anymore. 
or they don't like it that I go to church that often. And he prayed specifically that someone else would encourage me. And he asked God to have that happen. Maybe it's not healing somebody, brothers and sisters, but at least it's an example that when we step out beyond what we have known, willing to risk what is comfortable, just even a little bit, God can use us to work great things. And I am strongly convinced that God is working a great work in our society right now. What St. John Paul II called the new springtime of the church. And I know you've heard it, you probably are nauseous of me saying it, that this comes with us knowing intimately the love of God the Father through what's called baptism in the Holy Spirit. And to begin to step out and to know not just, the, not just the gifts of the Holy Spirit of knowledge, understanding, wisdom, courage, counsel, piety, and fear of the Lord. And God willing, not just the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which show that we are growing in holiness, patience, peace, love, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control, things that every single one of us should be praying for to continue to grow. But specifically also the charisms. That is, the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit. It was what allowed people in the early days of the church to know that Jesus was truly alive. That Peter, when he was preaching about Jesus raised from the dead, wasn't making it up because he had healed a crippled man in the name of Jesus. Because otherwise, wouldn't it seem a little crazy for somebody to say, oh, by the way, the Jesus that you guys killed, he's alive. I saw him, you didn't, but just trust me. You'd say, okay, call the straight jackets, cart them off to the loony bin. What was it that got people to believe that Jesus was in fact alive? It was the deeds of that his disciples did in his name. Now I know, brothers and sisters, that that's not all. That we're also called to strive for holiness. But in this day and age, which is so reticent to believe in God and has gotten tired of a Christian message that can only seem at times, I'm not saying this is always the case, but at times seems like it's just argument and rational debate that people try to dismiss as control, though we know it's not. People will dismiss our message as our trying to control people. Can you imagine that? Why? Because they haven't ever experienced what Jesus promises us. And so maybe, brothers and sisters, We want to pray today that God kind of break off in us anything that doubts these words that Jesus said. Again, us putting our faith not in ourselves, but in the one who says this to us. Amen, amen, I see to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father. And so we pray. Lord Jesus, these were your words. And Jesus, you know it's really hard for us to believe that you might want to use little old us. Little old sinful us to do these greater deeds. Jesus, we know that that's sometimes a bit of a scandal. It doesn't make sense to us, Jesus. But you said it, and we're going to believe it, and we're going to risk. Because we know 
that you have great plans for the church, especially through the triumph of your mother's immaculate heart. And so, Jesus, we ask that you may give us every grace that we need to believe not in ourselves, but in you. To believe not in what our own experience has taught us about the world and about your activity in the world, but to believe what you tell us, that greater things we will do because you give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, we ask you in your name to give us every grace that we need to stir up and fan in the flame that gift of the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit, to stir it up and fan it into flame, to come against everything that raises its head against the knowledge of you, Lord Jesus, that everything that raises its head against the knowledge of you, Lord Jesus, and an experience of your love and the Father's love for us and for others, may bend the knee now in Jesus' name. And that we may know truly that we know how you are leading us. That you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we can proclaim to others that you are the way, the truth, and the life. That as people could see the Father through you, Jesus, we ask for the grace, sinners though we tend to be, that people may see you in us so they may see the Father as well. Jesus, we ask this all in your most holy name. Amen.